Welcome to the Social Mission Revolution. Each week we explore some of the greatest undertold stories of businesses and everyday people who are making their ultimate impact on the world through social mission. This is Social Mission Revolution and this is your host, Andrea Putting. Welcome to the Social Mission Revolution. And today I'm here with Dr. Stephen Morse, who is a CEO and founder of Unchained Solutions. And I'm really looking forward to finding out what Unchained Solutions is all about and what that really, what that impact is that it's having in the world. So welcome, Stephen. Thank you, Andrea. It's great to be here today. Wonderful. So, Stephen, I'd like to start with a question, and that is, if there was just one thing for you to fight for, what would that be? The big fight is ending modern slavery in our world. Yeah, that is a very important and powerful thing to fight for. It is. It's very powerful. It's very complex. Uh, sometimes it's the fight to fight. Uh, if that makes sense, the, just yeah. the fight to get to the battle line uh, and certainly has been the case for me. But, yeah, fighting this uh, grievous crime, a global issue, uh, impacting more than 40 million people globally. And I'm sure there's certainly more that's just a conservative figure and really no one knows uh, in the end. But it's a, it's a global issue uh, and it's an issue for Australia as well. Those figures are astounding. I know many people don't even, doesn't even click, they don't even realise that there is still slavery in this world, which is kind of, it's sad that they don't realise, but it's also a lot sadder that there is. Yeah, well, despite modern slavery being abolished more than 150 years ago in the British Empire, uh, we know in other empires that it continued on, but there are more slaves in the world today than any other time in history. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing with uh, an issue. I mean, there's traditional modes of slavery, and I think Mauritania probably has the, the kind of the last vestige of, of an ancient form of slavery where slaves are continued and their families down the generations and slave owners own not just the slaves, but their families. That's a very ancient way to think about slavery. But modern slavery really is an umbrella term. It's one way of thinking about it in terms of legislation, and it, encap it captures things like uh, extreme forms of child labour, forced labour, servitude, domestic servitude, human trafficking, forced marriage, child soldiering. Uh, there's lots of, lots of abuses that uh, fall under that rubric. Yeah. Uh, from a, a human rights point of view, you might like to think of slavery as really just that someone's removed. It's the removal of someone's choice, voice, and movement. Uh, and they've limited or, con or controlling that that space. Wow, it's it's heavy uh, topic. It, it is a heavy topic, and but it's a very important one for us to have a conversation about. So, would you like to tell me a little bit about what Unchained Solutions does in the world? Sure. Well, Unchained inspires Australian organisations to be leaders in making an impact on modern slavery. So three words, inspire. Uh, we want to really put a positive, uh, not a spin if you like, but just really help companies to see the, the potential, see the opportunities uh, around addressing this issue. We want to inspire them to be leaders. So there's a lot of scope for leadership, for individuals, for business leaders, for companies to take a leading role in addressing mm -hmm. this issue. And really then to make an impact, a real impact. So the, temp the temptation is just, is for uh, sort of tick box, uh, box ticking exercises, yes. sorry. And uh, we really want to make sure that whatever companies do, that actually has, that resonates uh, in intangible ways, way down the bottom of the supply chain where workers are impacted. So that's in, that's the essence, that's our, that's our mission. And we use the Modern Slavery Act as a, as a mechanism, as a tool, uh, uh, to help companies. So there are lots of criteria around the Modern Slavery Act, what companies need to do. And we have an end-to-end -end service uh, to help companies to meet compliance and then to go beyond compliance, to lead beyond compliance. 
it's a lot of work there you've got going. <laughs> It is. We, we, we do. We have a lot on. Uh, we do a lot in the education, awareness and skills training space. So that's at the front end to engage boards and the exec senior executive to engage staff, key stakeholders, and also then also to engage suppliers because there's just a lot of people involved in this in the process. Modern slavery risk affects procurement, supply chain management, compliance, legal, finance, marketing, uh, consume like the communication channels companies to th think about how they're communicating and understanding the needs of their customers but also they need to set up credible grievance mechanisms whistleblower systems to actually hear the concerns of consumers and also of workers and so there's a lot of work being done in that space in addition to uh, education we then have a lot of uh, diagnostic uh, analysis tools and strategies to help companies uh, understand their risk yes there's a lot of things in there and i'll try to remember all of them to ship to ask you one thing that comes to mind is when we look at slavery people think of that as being a far off distant thing that doesn't happen in their own backyard mm -hmm. now what came to mind when you know, i was listening to you is that we probably have some slavery within Australia that we're that the majority of people are just blind to. Is that correct? Yes, we are blind to it. So we have uh, the official figures from the uh, Institute National Institute of Criminology is nineteen hundred cases in Australia. Uh, however, some NGOs would put that much higher, around fifteen thousand, conservative conservatively. We have at least uh, four and a half thousand cases of forced marriage in Australia alone. And, and then we have a spectrum of, of human rights violations for migrant workers, seasonal workers, backpackers, uh, unskilled, unskilled workers, and asylum seekers who get lost in this vast landscape called Australia. So there's a lot of uh, activity going on um, behind closed doors. Uh, in many in many sectors, uh, there's uh, in terms of things like nail salons, car washing, mm. security, general building cleaning services, then agriculture, horticulture, construction, mining. Uh, there's lots of industries where yeah slavery exists even in in Australia. It makes it hard to you know you can't quite pinpoint it, so you can't say oh, well, I'll keep away from that sort of business or or choose things a little bit differently because often we don't know where those where those points are. That's right. So no one chooses to work. No one chooses to be a slave. No. So often slavery uh, is, not, uh, is not really in the Hollywood-esque fashion where someone's <laughs> abducted and shoved into a van. No. Although that does happen. Yep. So we're, we're talking about people, we're talking about opportunism um, going sour for many people. You know, I, here I am, uh, I'm from a, a poor rural community, say in, in the highlands of, Tha of Thailand. And, um, you know, I'm from an impoverished community. There aren't any job prospects here. Um, I'm not well educated. And, you know, my parents are tenant farmers, they need money. So, you know, they, they will let me go with a recruiter. Uh, in inverted commas, uh, into the big city, down to Bangkok, or maybe into Malaysia, into Kuala Lumpur, um, with, the, with a view to getting a job, maybe as a maid in a, in a big house, or um, certainly respectable in the hospitality industry, even though there's exploitation in those sectors as well, um, only to be sort of, yeah, put to work in, in places, and they have, they've lost control. Um, they've lost control of their destiny, of their life, and someone has taken advantage of them. And that could be do, that. That's due to a lack of awareness, education, language, culture, and just not knowing the system, not knowing enough people, not knowing having enough connections, uh, and having enough money, and that makes people incredibly vulnerable. We see that, especially in Europe. I was based in in Spain for five years, and uh, Western Europe, Western European cities are, um, you know, have many people from from Eastern Europe, from Ukraine, Romania, Moldova even Russia, and also from sub-Saharan Africa, Nigerians, um, who are in these cities um, because 
for an opportunity that and that doesn't materialize um, yeah are exploited yeah and i i have seen a lot of that on tv shows in europe where people have been exploited that they've they've jumped at the opportunity to go to a western country yeah. <clears throat> thinking they're going to have a great new opportunities and then just have that exploitation of them yeah, and look, you don't need to need necessarily need to come from a poor, impoverished background. No. I mean, there, are, there are there are women, young women in in Europe coming from France or the UK, who are you know educated, have money, but they befriend they be, they uh, get involved in what is termed as a lover boy, mm -hmm. um, and you know this this is a relationship like any other re dating relationship that um, goes sour, and at some point. Um, the man, you know, makes a proposal. Let's go to Italy or Greece uh, for a holiday and or we'll spend some time for the season. Uh, and in the process, he's gained their trust. He's groomed this woman, lots of gifts, um, clothes, jewelry, uh, opportunities. And then um, in the foreign context is then put to work uh, in, in the sex industry. Um, you owe me, I've spent 10,000 pounds or 10,000 euros on you. Now you're in debt to me. And, and you must pay this back. So this happens, there's cases where this actually has happened in, the, in, in Europe. So it's not a necessarily a poor person's issue. Um, there are international mm. students from, uh, from Japan and from other parts of Asia who come to Australia and who, you know, through uh, situations, they, they run out of money or, uh, and we saw this in COVID, for example, COVID Absolutely. Plastic, uh, storm for this. There was a report put out last year uh, by the Univ uh, University of New South Wales and UTS around, uh, yeah, the impact of COVID on international students in Australia who through uh, not having access to JobKeeper mm -hmm. or any other government benefit um, were left uh, in some extent destitute, um, having to kicked out of their lodgings because they can't afford the rent, having to accept uh, jobs at a lower pay because they can now be exploited, not having any money to return back to Japan or not really being able to get out of the country <laughs> to yeah. do that in the first place. So COVID, um, you know, there were many, yeah, people such as myself who benefited from COVID, um, but there are lots of others who, uh, yeah, who through whom COVID was just a major issue and created, was a perfect storm for increased exploitation. Before I ask you some more in-depth questions, I want to know what is it that got you in to starting Unchanged Solutions? What is your background story in this? Sure. Well, I have a, I have a faith-based background, so um, I'm actually an Angl Anglican minister. Okay. Uh, by trade, that's my trade, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, but uh, through my own yeah, thinking, theology, philosophy, uh, really um, was drawn to certain issues of social justice uh, and in particular to this issue of, at that time, it was human trafficking. That was the, the buzzword in the sort of the, naughty, the late 90s and noughties. Uh, modern slavery was a term that came a bit later. And so really through that process, my wife, Sarah, who has a background, she's a registered nurse, she had spent many years uh, working in Romania with orphans uh, mm. uh, back in the early 2000s and had led teams of young adults to different parts, places, you know, a rubbish tip in Quito, uh, human trafficking, street trafficking in Athens, um, had done a bit of work in Zambia and India. So we, um, we just, yeah, took a, took a punt um, and travelled to Europe on the back of a British passport, which I have. So that enabled us at the time, not that I can do that now, uh, to uh, settle in Spain, become a permanent resident and really start exploring the issue of human trafficking into the sex industry in Spain. And we were there for five years. Sarah worked in a safe house for women coming off the streets uh, and you know, was a healthcare professional for them and working with a lot of Nigerian girls in particular. Uh, who had been put in detention because they were illegal Im immigrants, but once they had been had been assessed that they were had been trafficked, then they were released with temporary visas to then be assisted by um, safe houses, uh, by legal firms, and Sarah participated in that. And I worked on my doctoral research 
uh, to understand the push and pull factors around human trafficking in Europe uh, and particularly around sex trafficking, which is a huge issue <clears throat> in Europe. So this is kind of the, this is the, the backstory to Unchained. Um, we came back to Australia and in the course of 2017 saw an opportunity here with the emergence of the modern slavery legislation at a federal level and also at a state level for New South Wales. And we really saw that our lived experience could contribute uh, to helping companies not just tick a box, but to actually understand the real stories and how their activities at, at the top end of the supply chain will have an impact down the supply chain. So a lot of, yeah, my own spiritual conviction, uh, uh, it's, it's an issue that I've invested the last 12 years into. I can't escape it, actually. <laughs> You're a slave to it? I, I don't want to say that, but I... <laughs> well, I, you know, I just I, couldn't help myself. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I, well, I, at times I've worked for nothing so yeah. on, on this issue. So mm -hmm. it's a just, I just, I can't put it down. I'm, I'm so committed to it. Um, and I just, I'm doing everything I can to, to work at this issue. We've done work at the ground roots issue, but we really saw in that process that, you know, for every girl, young girl taken out of, off the streets, the traffickers, you know, often mafia led, will just put another person in their place. Yeah. So there was just endless, you know, and then the success rate of, for survivors coming through restoration programs was just so low. I'm like, okay, this, all this work is important. The, the street outreach, the safe houses, the protection of workers, you know, the, the protection uh, policies are all important, but what there's something needs to happen at the systemic level. Something needs to happen at the top. Those, because this is not just an issue of the, uh, on the ground. This is a, this is a socioeconomic cultural issue that crosses nations. And we have to address this at, at the level of government, which I don't have expertise in. I'm not a human rights lawyer or any sort of mm -hmm. litigator. Um, this has to happen with the private sector as well and consumers. But what are, what are companies doing? And with the Modern Slavery Act, it, its focus is on business. Or what could we do to help businesses in this space? So this is unchained. So what is it that businesses can do to help in this in this area to help prevent? Well, we want to prevent. We want to, we want to get people out of slavery, but we also want to prevent sure. people from yeah. getting there. So, what can they so do? So, companies that? need to. Well, the Modern Slavery Act is a is a is a mechanism. Really, it's a stimulus for me. It's a stimulus because there's no fine for non-compliance. It's a name and shame decision from the Minister for Home Affairs. So, this is really it's a stimulus. It's a race to the top. So, companies can do things by looking, doing their own housekeeping looking at seriously the, the way they do business. Um, how, do, how do they go about buying and sourcing products and services? Um, what is the process? What's the timing? Where are they looking for that? And, and, and with, with the products they buy, how are they managing their suppliers? So there's a lot they can do in-house to, to improve frameworks and policies and procedures and codes of conduct and all those things. And they're all good and they need to happen. And they need to, in a sense, create a, a mechanism of improvement. So, so because it's an annual reporting mechanism, they need to do investigative work, diagnostic work to understand what's going on and be transparent about it. And then they need to um, make, make decisions, reasonable steps to make changes. Um, and that those changes could be in improving policies, improving supplier engagement, doing further investigations, beyond the shores of Australia, because most companies at this point have only engaged T1 suppliers in Australia. So what's the next step? How do we actually, how do we actually cross waters? How do we actually engage suppliers that are in China, um, mm. which is another level of complexity? Um, there's a lot that companies can do to engage their consumers, their customers, um, their team, and really create a culture change in the way they do business. And this doesn't just touch, have a touch point with modern slavery. Modern slavery is kind of the poster child at the moment of human rights <laughs> in Australia, but there's also whatever they do to around due diligence with modern slavery will have touch points with other human rights issues uh, the companies need to address. And, and really, yeah, not just whitewash or greenwash the, the, the issue um, to look good, but to actually have a serious 
um, program. One company that we we we're not we haven't worked with, but we are in relationship with, if so to speak, had a great program because not everyone is involved in addressing modern slavery risk. So you might have you'll have a working group of key stakeholders and, and leaders who are steering the, the implementation piece. But then for the other t staff, um, they they developed a shared value partnership uh, with an NGO. So uh, who does work in Cambodia? So then they were able to then engage those the broader staff to say, well, whilst we're dealing with our implementation and our suppliers, here's a community of women who have come out of um, a trafficked or sla enslaved environment and they need to be rebuild their lives. They're, they've got micro loans, they're working together under a micro financing scheme to start their own businesses. We could actually partner with them by, first of all, relationship, by going and spending time with them and understanding their needs. That's the best thing to do. Uh, and that's actually more what companies need to do is to get out of Australia when we can uh, and actually understand what the issues are on the ground. Um, and then really through interpersonal relationship, really seek ways to provide assistance. And it could be through like a 1% model where I give 1% of time, 1% of money or 1% of my skills mm -hmm. time to helping people start, start a business or develop their community. It could be, it could even have touch points with classic modes of aid and development um, because it's not just the factory or it's not just the farm or it's not just the fishing boats where the slavery occurs. There's the whole infrastructure, a whole um, superstructure, the word, like an ecosystem, that's what I'm thinking of, um, where if we address the broader ecosystem, that will actually help prevent um, the risk of slavery in the first place, if that makes sense. Yeah, so much there. <laughs> Big vision. <laughs> Big vision and a lot of work. One of the things that, that constantly whenever I hear about slavery is that my mind goes into kind of overload as far as being a consumer, but also I know this reflects into business, is it's just that we have to be willing to spend more money. We do. Because... All those cheap items out there that we, you know, you go to the shop and say, oh, it's only $2. Well, I, I'll buy that. And, hey, um, why is it $2? Or I look on, on the internet and I see clothes that are just ridiculously cheap. And I can't bring myself to buy them because in the back of my mind is how are they so cheap? Yep. And it's a good question. It's a question I have as a consumer, you know, as someone who does online shopping for my groceries, I haven't got a lot of time to vet a, the 85 products that I buy from the yes. supermarket every week. Uh, and it wouldn't be a weekly job. Uh, buying clothes um, is, is, is difficult. Uh, you know, I'm a startup. I'm a small business. I, I'm not uh, flush with cash. So for me to then make um, good choices, uh, sustainable choices. Um, yeah, maybe uh, buying a pair of jeans for 40 bucks is not the best thing. I'm, I might have to spend at least $180 on a pair of jeans to make sure it's, you know, but I don't have that kind of money and I've got two kids and yeah, so it's yeah, not it, it's not easy and, I, mm -hmm. I, and I'm not standing here today uh, as someone pointing the finger. I'm actually as someone who's also... Um, trying to make conscious choices. And I think part of it is just coming up with a plan because it's very hard. The challenge of modern slavery is having a sustained, uh, intentional approach to unearthing everything. <laughs> you start peeling the onion, you'll find issues all over the place. So it's more about making choices, conscious choices and coming up with a plan. Well, let's, you know, maybe over the next six months, let's focus on our groceries and how we source our groceries or how do we, when we do DIY on our home, uh, let's focus on where, we, where, where those supplies come from. Um, yeah. What's Bunnings doing, for example, with those products and, you know, and Bunnings is working in the space, part of West Farmers. So that, you know, it's, that's one of the big companies working on this issue. So there's, I think it's about coming up with a plan because it can be overwhelming. And yeah, it's, there's so much to consider actually considering 
you know, the amount that we consume. Uh, we're so used to consuming and consuming in large volume at cheap prices, at fast turnarounds. And this, all this feeds into modern slavery risk. Yeah. So bit by bit, we have to just one thing at a time. Yep. Find our way into just being aware. Yep. Being aware, making conscious and, you know, not being afraid to engage your, your brands. Um, I'm a consumer. I mean, I do that now, even as a company, whenever I want to find a supplier for a particular need that I have, I, that's the first thing I ask. Actually, it's, it's a way of getting business. Um, <laughs> what, are you, what, are you, <laughs> what are you saying about modern slavery? I can't find your modern slavery statement. Um, do you have a policy? Uh, do, you have any, <laughs> do you have a sustainability policy? I can't see anything on human rights. Can you send me some information? <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, you know, and then it happened to me. I was, I was, I was doing this a few weeks ago. I was um, trying to get some some funds and approached uh, uh, an online one of these fintech companies. And and you know, through the process of it, I said, "Well, look, I'm 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 considering your offer, but I'm really actually quite concerned about where the money is. Where is the money coming from? Where do you raise your money to fund businesses?" Um, can you please send me some information? So they sent me a list of exclusions of, of um, supply, you know, donors who they don't receive money from, so they don't engage in, you know, tobacco or firearms or all those kind of classic things that, you know, that yeah. are excluded. And I said, that's great, but um, you're an ASX, ASX listed company. You, I can't find your modern slavery statement. And, and they said, oh, it should be up there with the modern slavery register. I said, well, it's not. Um, well, thank you for letting us know. Well, that's fine. <laughs> uh, so they sent it to me. And then, I, you know, we have a process at Unchained of assessing statements. So I then went through their statement and found all the gaps and then went back to them and said, oh, look, having read your statement, um, I see you're a bit silent on this and you could be a bit strong on that. So would you be interested in having a phone call? Uh, to talk about your current strategy, which I haven't heard back from, but anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, you know, part of it is, yeah, um, just getting into good habits, uh, that it becomes a question. Um, every time I buy something, um, I think about it and, yeah, have a look, see what companies are saying about themselves. Um, mm. Yeah. And that makes me think as businesses and a lot of, you know, my market for this podcast is around businesses. So for them to think about what is, do they have a modern slavery statement? Mm. What is it they're thinking about, you know, if they're interested in doing good and leaving a legacy and being an authentic influence on the world, then this is something that they need to contemplate along with. <laughs> along with rap and along with climate change and along with diversity and inclusion and bullying. Oh, it's so much stuff. <laughs> Gender equality. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm mindful of that. And look, I have, I've had clients who say to me and quite great conversations, look, this issue, um, look, it's number 10, you know, like we've got all these, this list of 10 issues of compliance and, oh, is this the, the government's, another way that the government's interfering in, in business and trying to control us? And we had a great chat. It was kind of like, you know, but it depends on how you view things. Is it, is it just a tick and, fix, tick and flick compliance piece or is it an opportunity? And this is part of our Inspire at Unchained. We want to inspire companies to see the opportunities um, in being ethical Yes, not, um, you know, there's great benefits for business um, in, t in mitigating the risk. Yes, there are advantages around uh, tendering for business being stronger in the market. Uh, but there's also, you know, if we strengthen our supply chains and strengthen economies elsewhere, that also opens markets. Um, if people are paid better, um, they have a, a stronger buying power then that becomes another market uh, for your business. Um, if we're the only ones who are wealthy and everyone else is poor, then it limits the scope. So there's lots of opportunities for companies. Sure, sure the short-term pain will be higher prices, 
um, which we need to consider, but the long-term benefits are there for companies if they can just, yeah, wait, yeah, see it through. Amazing. Fantastic stuff, Stephen. I'm really glad that I've had you on the show to, to have this conversation. So before we go, if you're talking, you, the beginning you're talking about how you feel so passionate about this, this is something that you just have to do. If somebody else had had felt that way about something, what advice would you give them? Well, uh, hang in there. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it's a long journey. It's definitely been a long journey for us, uh, having spent you know five years in Spain and now three years on this business. Uh, it's a long, long process. Um, do your homework. Uh, do your research really yeah put a plan in place to um yeah do what you want to do if that's you know setting up an ngo you might want to set up a, your own charity or you might want to just start a movement a campaign um there's a few campaigns out there already but if you want to start another one that's fine uh, or if you want to start a business like some sort of consulting firm or even if you're a tech person perhaps and you want to say well i could i could probably help with a, set up some sort of diagnostic analytical tool um, to help uh, around the traceability. So I think, yeah, there's, um, yeah, for me, yeah, the resilience has come through just persevering um, and, yeah, yeah, pushing through some of what are the limitations and taking risks. Um, yeah, this is a big risk-taking uh, area. So if you want, yes. yeah, just develop the stomach for it, go for it. <laughs> Though I say it will disrupt your entire life, but you can't not do it. <laughs> well, it is highly disruptive. So oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, completely disrupted as a person. Yeah. So but that's that's good. I mean, uh, I'm alive. You know, yeah. that's the thing. I, I, what I love about what I'm doing is is the purpose. Just living and working on on a purpose that's bigger than me, bigger than my needs. It's it's scary. Uh, it pushes me uh, out of my comfort zone every every single week. Um, I'm faced with a new challenge, um, doing a podcast, you know, that's, uh, that's, that can be stretching in, a, in and of itself, not <laughs> that I'm necessarily stretching for me, but, you know, just being out to being prepared to step out and talk to people, engage people, engage the issue, and also be prepared for the, for the knockbacks and the criticism, you know, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, or, you know, you've got nothing to offer or whatever, you know, like if you've got, if you believe in what you're doing, and you do the homework, then, you know, no one knows what they're doing. Like really, I mean, in many respects they do, but there's just a lot of unknowns and yeah. um, there's, you know, a lot of posturing that goes on as well. So we're all learning together mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. And so there's a lot of scope for collaboration, skills training, working together and finding ways, a niche to operate in. Lots of things for us to, to work with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's just take it's taking that risk and just going out there and going i have to do this no matter what and keeping to what you believe in i think yeah yeah jumping off planes surfing the edge of chaos yeah. uh, all those kinds of things yeah it's all fun lots of fun <laughs> keeps you going keeps you yes. alive <laughs> exactly. so if someone wants to get in touch with you and find out more about unchained solutions and how they can become more proactive against modern slavery how do they get in touch with you yeah that was our website so unchainedsolutions.com.au we've got a number on the main channels so our handle is generally unchained au or underscore au or you can find me dr stephen morse i'm most active on linkedin uh, it's my preferred platform uh if you want to get involved there's lots of great campaigns out there um if you're more into campaigning, so, you know, there's A21 have campaigns, Be Slavery Free have campaigns, Baptist World Aid have campaigns. Uh, there's other organisations that you can volunteer with. We're also always looking for people to, to work with us, um, either as interns or, you know, potential employees because we're, we're, we're growing, we're scaling. So, yeah, if you're interested in knowing more, I'm always happy to chat and point you in the right direction if that's not with us or with somebody else. Uh, I'm not in this space to just talk about Unchained Solutions because I think we can't do this. We can't, no one can do anything 
constructively or permanently or with any impact without working with other other entities. So mm -hmm. this is a collaborative approach from government, private sector, NGOs, small businesses, individuals uh, working together to fight this trade. Well, thank you so much, Stephen, for being on Social Mission Revolution today. I've really enjoyed speaking with you. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much uh, yeah, for having me today. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. And that's all we have for Social Mission Revolution today. I'll be back next time with another Social Mission Revolutionist. This has been the Social Mission Revolution with Andrea Putting. Join me again next week when we'll speak to another social mission revolutionist who will inspire you on your journey to making your ultimate impact on the world.